Hey guys, hope you're doing well and you had a good weekend or a good start to your week or whenever you're listening to this podcast. I just want to quickly remind you, I'm really honestly terrible at this, but we have, if all you do is listen to the Dad Tired podcast, which I'm so grateful that you do that, but if that's like your only experience with Dad Tired, you're missing a big chunk of what we do as a ministry. Somebody recently tagged me or on Instagram and, and said that they, one of the husbands or a couple husbands had been listening to the Dad Tired podcast and they heard that there was a community map where they could find other dad tired guys. And so I think they plugged that in and some other guys got involved. And then there was a group of guys, dad tired guys who started meeting and just encouraging each other as husbands and dads and disciples. And then they hit it off so much that they're like, Hey, we should get our wives involved. And so the wives started to join in and now like they meet regularly, they've become good friends, kids are involved. And it's just turned into a whole group of friends that are cheering each other on to be the best disciples they can be for Jesus. And so it's really like that picture is exactly my dream for Dad Tired, that we would obviously have good content. We we have interviews and books and all kinds of stuff where we can learn and study and study God's word and all that stuff. But really like my dream is that all of that would be fleshed out in real life. And so I say all that because we do have community. We have a group of guys online. If you if you go to dadtired.com forward slash community and I'll put a link in the show notes for you. If you go there, you'll see that we have an online community. There's tons of guys who are just really, really encouraging each other. We have Facebook groups and Instagram and stuff, but this is a private community that we have, and it costs $5 a year to join. (laughs) So very, very cheap to join this. And the reason I did that, like if you're like, dude, why even do $5 a year? It barely pays the cost for us to even like subscribe to this platform that we use to have this community. The reason we do it, honestly, just like friend to friend, podcast listener to podcast listener here, or podcast talker to podcast, I don't know. Friend to friend, the reason I do that is because it just weeds out all the creepy people who try to just go into groups and like disrupt and like cause arguments and be weird and want to fight about things that aren't worth fighting about. And so when you put just like a little bit of a wall, even just $5 a year to be part of this, it really makes us zero money. But I shouldn't say that. It it probably makes, you know, (laughs) a little bit of money. But the bigger thing is that we can weed out people who shouldn't be there, who are just trying to disrupt and be divisive. And so what we find is that the quality of the conversations in this group is just really, really high. It's like solid dudes, normal guys who really are trying to be like Jesus and be good husbands, fathers, disciples. And a lot of them are podcasts, but most of them I would say are podcast listeners. And so it's just a, it's a very like-minded group of guys. So all that to say, if you just want to like jump on today, there's an app for it. If you just go to dadtire.com forward slash community, again, there's a link right there in your show notes. You could just click that and it'll take you right there, but join the online community. And that way you can just meet other guys. You can meet guys who are going to the retreat this fall. You can meet guys who listen to the podcast. You can, you can even, there's, there's a tab on there where you can actually find guys near you and it will show you all the dad tired guys who live near you. It's just, it's a really, really cool feature or a really cool group with, with lots of features and lots of guys in there that are solid. So do that. And then also we are doing local meetups. We have like, I think a hundred and close to 150 groups all over the country and world. And we want more of these. So the other way you can do this is when you go to dadtired.com forward slash community, if you just click find guys or find groups near me, you'll see a map and there's just dad tired guys, groups all over the country and world. So look to see if there's one near you. If there is, just reach out. The contact information for that host is right there. You can just click on that and you know reach out and um, touch base with that guy. Or if there's not one near you, then just put your name on the map. And to be a host, it's like super easy. We're going to have questions after each podcast. So when you go to show notes, you'll see some questions and those are discussion questions. You can use those as a way to start meeting together with guys and have good discussion. Because sometimes guys get together, they don't really know how to like talk to each other about deeper stuff. So if you feel like that or you feel like you're getting to get stuck, just go to the show notes page and you can kind of use the podcast questions as discussion. Or you can go through the Stop Behaving Devotional or you can go through the Dead Tire book or any other book you want to go through. It's really, really low key. Like you can, as a host, you can pick how often you want to meet. If you want to meet once a week, once a month, once a quarter, once a year, it doesn't matter. Like there are no rules. So just, I shouldn't say there's no rules. Like, you know be like Jesus, but we're not going to give you tons of like stuff that you need to do. Basically, you just put your name on the map, put your contact information on there, an email or phone number, however you want guys to contact you. And then just 
you know, figure out a time when guys reach out and say, Hey, I live near you. Just figure out, do you guys want to meet once a week or a month or a year or whatever? I can hear my baby screaming in the background. And this introduction has gone way longer than I planned for it to go. All that rambling to say, we just really want you to get connected, man. We want you to find good friends. It's hard to find good friends. We want you to eventually find other couples and other families near you that are trying to chase after Jesus like you are. And so we just really want you to get connected. There's tons of good content out there. There's a lack of good community, and we want to help you find both good content and good community. So all that to say, and I'm sorry for rambling, dadtired.com forward slash community. All right. I'm sorry. <laughs> I love you guys. This is going to be a great episode for you. There's a, this is a topic that a lot of guys uh, are struggling with in some shape or form, or you know a guy who's struggling with this in some shape or form. So I think it's going to be helpful. Sathya, so glad to have you back, man. You've been on the show before. You're doing some good work, dude, to like just help a lot of guys with a subject that we're, that a lot of people are afraid to talk about. And you're just like, you're on the front lines of it. So before we dive into all that and what you're up to in that regard, maybe just catch us up from the last time we talked. What are you up to these days? And you know, what's life look like for you now? Yeah. Thanks for having me back, man. It's always great to be here. And I, I feel the same way about what you're doing. It's so important. Mm. And you know, the work I'm doing, helping guys get free of pornography, you realize how important the family is and yeah. how much brokenness and fatherlessness especially plays into a lot of the stories of our clients. And so I think what, what you're doing with Dad Tired is so significant on the mm. preventative side. Since the last time I was here, I would say quite a bit has changed. I had just been in the early stages of deep clean. I think you and I met actually on a TV set. We were both yeah. uh, you know, interviewing and sharing about our stuff. And that interview for me was one of the first times I was just more publicly sharing about the work I'm doing and some of my story and all that kind of stuff. And it's been amazing to see, I would say in the last two years, deep clean has just grown significantly, like can barely keep up with the demand. That's been awesome in some ways, but it is a little bit heartbreaking as well because you just see the struggle and how many people are really struggling and have not been able to find a solution to this issue. Yeah. And the pandemic really was a part of that because the between the isolation, people being at home, and then guys specifically like being cooped up in their offices, sort of like mm -hmm. enslaved to their devices a little bit, not a great recipe for someone who's already maybe struggling a little bit, kind of edging with a porn addiction. We yeah. saw a lot of guys, kind of the scales tipped in not so good of a way. Mm. And so uh, we've been able to help a lot more people as a result, and that's been a huge blessing. But it's definitely been a tough time, I think, for, for guys across the board. And then uh, for me personally, I just released a book called The Last Relapse uh, the last few months, and mm. that's been super fun as well. We, I mean, we charge for our services and our program, but the book was kind of a way of just getting our best resources out to people at a very low barrier to entry. That's been amazing. The response has been really positive. Awesome. Um, yeah, so it's been good. Oh, and I launched a podcast as well. So I have a daily podcast called At Least oh, nice. the Man Within, which wow. you interviewed on, I think, pretty early on. You were one of, one of my first yeah. guests, I think. Wow. So it's it's been daily? Fun. Daily, yeah, daily Holy podcast. Cow. Jeez, man. Yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. uh, you must not have four kids because I can't know. <laughs> I can't imagine. I can't imagine. <laughs> that is true. That is true. I don't have four kids. Yeah. <laughs> I can't you, imagine. Doing one you daily. know what? The, the reason I, I do it daily is because like when I was struggling, I just needed encouragement as much as I could get it, you know, mm. just like hope that it was possible and inspiration and everything else. So, you know, four episodes a week, it's just bite-sized nuggets. And we just talk about, we basically just share content from our coaching calls, you know, to give people insights into what other guys are asking about as well. So they don't feel so alone in it. And right. then uh, once a week, I get to interview awesome guests like yourself, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's fun. And you're right. I'm sure when I have more kids or when I start <laughs> having kids rather that might change, but for now it's a daily podcast. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Well, I want to hear for those of the guys who haven't, you know, we, we got a lot of new listeners to the show and maybe they haven't heard your story. Maybe just rewind a little bit, just like personally for you, mm -hmm. give us a, a you know, an overview of what your story was or is or was specifically in this, this realm of pornography and addiction to the pornography. Yeah. So I'm a fourth generation pastor. So my dad, granddad and great granddad were all ministers. Wow. So just grew up in the church. That was normal. And I was very fortunate to have like good pastor parents. You know, I'm not like the scarred PK who <laughs> rebelled and all that. They were the same people off the stage they were on it. And so Growing up was really good for me. And I say that because I got exposed to pornography for the first time in the computer lab of my Christian school when I was about 11 oh, years old. Wow. Wow. And so everything was set up for me to make good decisions, to not fall into that stuff. And to be honest, when I. Hold on, let's just practically pause there because we got a lot of yeah. dads who are listening who have their kids in Christian school or are thinking, 
with all the chaos happening in our world right now, they're like, maybe I should put my kids into Christian school. So they hear <laughs> that. And I know it's going to be a hang of like, oh my gosh, like what, how does that even happen? You know? Yeah, I know. Well, and it's crazy too, because it, it was totally innocent. Like I remember my buddy just came up to me and was like, hey, my friend told me to check out this website. He might have already checked it out himself and knew what it was and was yeah. trying to play innocent about it. But it was an innocent sounding website. It was, I mean, I, I won't repeat it because unfortunately it's still a pornographic website today. Mm. But it was weird. It was weird for that to happen, you know, in a Christian school of all places. I think one of the misnomers about Christian school, because I was in Christian education from grade four to grade 12, is that these things don't happen. They do happen, but I think what's different for me and what I can say about my Christian education is I had at least a, a pretty clear line of that when I was doing something I shouldn't be doing, I knew what the right thing was and yeah. I kind of knew God's nature. Like I, I just had that, that yeah. predisposition to who God really was. And so it took me a while to reach that place, though, admittedly. So I got exposed when I was 11 years old. By the time I was in high school, I was watching porn with some regularity. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is that my peer group in my Christian school was, I would say, that we were all doing the same thing, you know, and we all kind of knew it. It wasn't like disgusting locker room talk where we're like talking about it openly, but it was sort of understood like right. we shouldn't be doing this, but we're doing it. By the time I was in university, my goal at the time was to become a psychiatrist. So I was studying really hard. I was volunteering. I had like five figures in research grants. I was doing tons of research and stuff. Uh, very high achieving academically. And porn was like my medicine to just cope with the stress that came mm. from all of that. And it was kind of my reward as well, if I'm being honest. It was sort of the way I kind of got a, a payout, you know, because when you're working hard in school, you don't get a paycheck at the end of the day. So that was when I would say I was properly addicted because I would plan my days around it. It was very rare I would go a day without it. It was just sort of my crutch, you know, and I always told myself I could stop when I need to. Yeah. And then that time did come I, in the middle of my degree is where I would say I really gave my life to Jesus. Again, not that I wasn't a Christian before. I was going to church. I was on worship teams and all that kind of stuff. But that was where I really made a decision like, okay, God, my life is yours. And I knew the drill. You know, I knew what came with that decision. And so it meant I had to drink more responsibly or not drink at all. It meant mm -hmm. I had to clean up my language and it meant I had to stop watching porn. And those first two things were no problem. You know, first couple of weeks, I felt like a new person and I was in control, but I couldn't for the life of me shake porn. Mm -hmm. And so that was when I was like, oh, okay, this is way worse, you know, than anything I had imagined. That's sort of where my story of recovery begins. Mm -hmm. I want to pause because there's a couple of things you said in there that I think guys can relate to. One, first, I want to go all the way back again to Christian education when you first were exposed. I just had this thought when you said that, like the verse that talks about how sin is just crouching at our door, you know, and it's like, even mm. when we're thinking for our kids, I'm going to put them in the Christian education. There'll be a little bit, we, most of us aren't naive to think, you know, they're not going to be exposed to sin. None of us are that though. You know, like we all know that yeah. there's, <laughs> there's sin happening everywhere, but we just try to make them a little, a little bit harder but man, sin is crouching. It's just like, it's ready at all times. And, and the guard goes down for a second or even just innocence, right? Like you just, you weren't even trying. You were, you're just at, you're in the computer lab at your school and some friends like, Hey, look at this. And just, that's how quickly the reason we have these conversations is one for us as men, but two for my, our sons and our daughters, like that's how quickly life can change. I remember the first time I had a friend show me porn. It's a pivotal moment in my life. The reason I say all that is just, it's just crouching, man. Like, this is why we're on guard. This is why we pray constantly. This is why we figure out all the tools and resources and study that we can, because it's just crouching at our door and our kid's door all the time. Yeah. And it's why the work you're doing is so important, Jared, because I think in a perfect scenario, it's not that kids don't get exposed to this stuff. It's that when they do, they've already had the conversations at home mm -hmm. or they've already been trained so that they know how to respond to it. You know, one of my friends, Carl Thomas, he just released a book called When Shame Gets Real. And he talks about how like he warned his kids about the dangers of pornography when they started to, you know, get their own cell phones and that kind of thing. And he just told them, hey, if you do encounter this stuff, just tell dad, like you're not going to mm. be in trouble. I'd just like to know. Yeah. And they did. They took his word for it, you know, and mm. obviously that's the fruit of the relationship he had built over time with them. Yeah. for them to follow through on it. But yeah, it's all the more reason why, you know, I commend your listeners even for just listening, trying to just get a glimpse to lead their lives and their children's better because that's kind of where it all starts because we can't stop people from seeing it, but we can definitely help them respond better. Yeah. And I like that approach, you know, to tell our kids that, you know, when you see this, because, you, you know, when you see this, come talk to me, I'd like to know, but I really like that. That's a really non-threatening way to just immediately try to get in the middle of that shame and that shame cycle that our kids are going to immediately feel as you were, you know, you're immediately exposed to it or you're initially exposed to it. And then you start to, be, it becomes more of a habit. 
was your dad ever aware of that or was there any conversations with your dad about any of that so that conversation happened later admittedly like my parents are both east indian mm -hmm. and indian culture is just very hush about these things you don't really mm -hmm. talk about sex in the home mm -hmm. and then you you know slap on the fact that we're conservative christians dad's yeah. a pastor it just, i think it it's wasn't true happening. every culture i think it's true every culture but probably i know what you're saying it's like especially oh, for in our sure. culture yeah but yeah i mean most families aren't having conversations about like Porn, especially like Christian families, you know. Yeah, yeah, and exactly. We just don't know how to approach it, but yeah, I totally, I totally hear what you say. I didn't mean to interrupt you. So okay, so it was kind of like, you know, it's pushed. Nobody really talked about it. it wasn't it, there wasn't not, a place to not say. not really no. And it wasn't until I was recovering and I was a bit more open with my parents. I had sort of opened up to them, and my dad was like, "Hey, that's so awesome that you're doing that." I, you know, I just want to let you know that I actually struggled with this as well. This is a generational thing for us. So wow. just factor that, factor that in as you start to seek some solutions. So he was wow. really supportive that way. How old were you when he said that to you? 24, maybe Dang. 25. Wow. Yeah. What did that do for you to hear that from your dad? It was really liberating because yeah. I think like if you don't hear your parents share about their struggles or shortcomings or that kind of stuff, obviously it has to be age appropriate, but you just assume that they haven't figured out, right? And I think, wow. at least for me, especially with my dad being a pastor, very respected kind of man of God. Mm. So I think for me in my head, I just always assume he probably doesn't struggle with it. Why am I? Like, what's wrong with me? Mm. So I think there was an element of like, oh, okay, this is like, there's more to this picture and it's not just like, I'm not just horribly flawed, you know? Yeah. So really helpful. And then he also like, again, just the tense he used is like, yeah, I struggle with this as well. And I got help. He said something to that effect. Mm. So again, just like that model of like, oh, dad struggled with it, but he also did his part. Yeah. And so it just, it affirmed like, I should be doing something about this as cool. well. If he can do it, I can do it too. I love that. I love that. I wrote about this particular topic in one of the books that I just wrote that's going to be coming out. And I talked about how there are so many pastors who are struggling with this, with an addiction yeah. to pornography. So many pastors. I've been in the church world a long time. I know a lot of godly men and who are just like struggling with this and they, nobody would ever know because you're trying to lead. It's a weird place to be for a leader. Someone that's trying to be a spiritual leader. It's a really, they have very few people to go share this with. But the tricky part is, and I wrote about this, is like, it's, I want to tell you that one, to encourage you to like, all the shame you're feeling like, dude, I promise you, you're not alone. Even like you're most likely your leaders have experienced yeah. this to some level. But I also don't, what my fear was, is I tell you this and then now you're going to use that as an excuse. Well, my pastor, does it, so, you know, and so, yeah. so I love that your dad said, you know, he admitted his struggle, but also, and here's, I also got help, yeah. which is just, that's man. I love that. Let's like talk about a little bit of your recovery journey. What did that look like? How did that get started? Cause most guys are Hearing this, I would say 99% of guys admit to struggling with pornography in some shape or form and 1% lie, right? Which is a totally, yeah. I, I heard that somewhere and I thought that's really accurate and totally made up, but it's not a real statistic. <laughs> but so every guy is listening to this right now and they're feeling like, you know, I've struggled with this in some way, but is there really hope? Like I, I, we, had, we don't meet that many guys who are like, dude, I, I struggle with this and, and God's redeemed me. Those mm -hmm. stories are so rare. So tell us a little bit about your story of recovery. And then I want to get into like, the more and more stories that we're, you're hearing of guys who are actually overcoming this stuff. Yeah, big time. So I was probably mid twenties when I started to kind of embark on the recovery journey and was totally clueless and didn't have the benefit of podcasts in those days, uh, blogs for sure. But most of the stories that I heard were like, yeah, I used to struggle with porn by God's grace. I'm set free and like, praise him. That's it, you know, and yeah. very little about the in-between. So that was a really frustrating part for me. I started out with like an internet filter. So, you know, just putting something on there that was going to stop me. The logic of an internet filter is, makes perfect sense. It's like, this is the behavior that I'm doing that I don't want to do. Right. Let's put a barrier in front of it. The problem is like in the heat of a moment, there's always, you know, like surprise, surprise, we find ways around these barriers, right? <laughs> right, right? And so that was the case for me as well. I did get an accountability partner and I would say that was really helpful it was helpful to have another peer who just understood the issue who was working through it as well but admittedly like he was the only voice in my corner mm. and it was sort of the blind leading the blind because we mm. we could offer the peer-to-peer -peer support but there wasn't the expertise to kind of lead me past it so mm. 
that was a bit futile as well. Again, helpful for sure, but it, it didn't change much long term mm. in my behavior. So that got me curious because to be honest, most of the people I spoke with were always pointing to internet filters and accountability partners. Right. Right. And, you know, even to this day, I'm not against them by any means. I think just for me, they were good starting points, but incomplete solutions. I eventually enrolled in a program. This is actually a ministry school to, to help train to become a pastor. But their mission was to have pastors that stood the test of time, that didn't have moral failures, that loved their wives more than their ministry. And so they had a, just a very different approach. And a lot of the emphasis was on having a healthy heart. So character ethic recovering from traumas of the past, you know, just those kinds of things. Mm. And that's when I start to notice a change in my behavior. Again, not directly tackling the porn issue per se, yep. but just starting to understand myself better, starting to heal from parts of the past, areas where I had unforgiveness and that kind of thing. And when I started to work through that, that's when the needle really started to move forward. It's not that my desires necessarily changed. It's that I felt more in control of myself because I understood myself better. Yeah. And I also believed, I started to believe the things that I heard from the pulpit that, you know, God loves me, that I don't know, that I'm, I'm worthy of love, that I deserve it, that he actually unconditionally mm -hmm. loves me. Those things really start to penetrate my heart. And I think when that started to take place, I just started to see myself differently and make different decisions. And again, it wasn't an overnight thing. This was worked out over a couple of years. When I finished that ministry training program, I became a full-time pastor and I probably went about eight, 10 months without watching porn or anything like that. I was, I was just doing so well, really thriving in the role, and I had a relapse. It was pretty devastating for me just because I thought, oh my gosh, like I've made all this progress. I knew I wasn't going to lose my position over it. I had some conversations with leadership about it prior, but it was still really scary, you know. And mm -hmm. the really cool thing is because of the progress I had made of just loving myself better, understanding the situation, I just knew it's just one moment. Like it's just one day. I was able to just contextualize it a little bit better, respond without beating myself up, without the woe is me, like spiraling into the debt cycle, the doubt cycle. And I recovered pretty quickly. And it was probably another another couple of weeks, couple of months of just realizing, okay, there's a couple of areas in my heart I still need to tackle, do a little bit more work. And then February 2016 was when I had my last relapse. Wow. Well, I want to get into some of the specifics of that. But as you're talking, man, I'm just and and talking about the filters and the accountability partner, I had this just kind of the image pop in my head. Like I think when we think about our relationship with Jesus and his redemptive work in our lives, sometimes I think we look at it as like, God wants to tidy up the room. So if we like, actually I'm sitting in a rental house cause we haven't found, uh, got our house yet in South Carolina. And so yes. you can't see on camera, but the house, this room is a mess You know, <laughs> all around me. My kids have destroyed my little office space here. But sometimes I think as Christians, we come in and it's like, okay, I, we should probably just pick this up. Our God wants me to clean this up right? Mm. That's kind of the idea. God wants me to clean this up. And that's kind of how I look at the internet filters and the accountability, all good stuff, like for sure, like it can be helpful, but I think what Jesus actually wants to do is like burn the house down and build a new house. Yeah, <laughs> And that sounds way more daunting to be honest, but I think this yes. is what Jesus would mean when he says, come and die. And that's really the process of like, I think what you're talking about, which is I don't need to just kind of fix up, tidy up my behavior that won't last. It'll be exhausting and, mm -hmm. and it just won't last because there's deeper stuff there. I actually need to let Jesus like burn the house down and from there rebuild up because there's some deep, deep, deep roots. It's not just like clean up the room. It's like there's black mold in the walls, you know, the, the place yeah. needs to be demolished. And I'm taking this analogy way too far. It's going to break down if I keep going, if I keep going too far on it. But I, hopefully that translates. When I hear you talk like that, I think there's a lot of guys, I don't know, there's probably, they probably feel a mix of hopeful and just like totally discouraged because in some ways it would be easier just to clean the house. But it's like, oh man, I think if I really want to tackle this issue and admit this is probably an addiction and I got to figure this out, like it's not just some behavioral changes. It's like, I got to address some deep pain and hurts. Like I got to let God burn it all down. Yeah. So I don't know. What would you say to the guy who's kind of feeling like, I believe there's hope. It sounds like you had some life change and maybe some other guys, but like, I don't know if I'm ready to burn the house down, dude. Yeah. Well, nobody is, you know, that's the honest truth. Like <laughs> yeah. if, I if porn, yeah, yeah. yeah, if porn wasn't enticing, it wouldn't be a problem, right? Like mm. I, there's a reason that we're hooked on something like that. And it's funny, like we get guys in our program who will, they get off to a great start and then they kind of have this point where they're like, oh, my life is changing. I'm letting go of something that has been a source of comfort for me for 
two decades, four decades. I mean, we just had a guy sign up who is 70 years old. Wow. And he has, he has struggled for five decades, 50 wow. years. Wow. And so, you know, you're letting go of a source of comfort that's been there for a majority of your life. Praise God, that, by the way. Like just yeah. the, the repentance at 70, dude, like that. No, this Praise guy's God, amazing. Man. Praise this God. Guy, this so guy, cool. just ha- he just had a major aneurysm. And mm. like he told me, because I, I kind of asked him like, hey, at this age, why? Yeah. And he said, you know what? I could go any day. And I don't want to graduate to eternity with this in my life. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was so profound. Dude, every listener, every listener who's listening to this right now, take heart from that guy. Like, be encouraged by that guy. The 70-year-old man who says, I'm not going to take this with me to my grave. Like, don't yeah. be the 70-year-old guy. You know, like, do it now. <laughs> Dude, uh, but also, praise God for the 70-year-old guy who's got the repentant, humble heart, man. I love that. That's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. And that is what I would say to the person who's like, I don't know. I don't know if I'm really ready to let go of this or make a change. You're never ready for it. And you're going to have moments where you're absolutely disgusted by it. But you're also going to have moments where it still has the enticement and the intrigue. But what those moments do is they lie to us because we get so focused on the issue itself that we lose sight of the ripples. Hmm. But if you really think about the cost of porn spiritually, emotionally, mentally, relationally, vocationally. You know, I have clients who got fired from their jobs because they were watching porn on their laptop, like their work laptop. When you think about how it affects your productivity, the dreams and the goals in your life, all those kinds of things. I mean, it's a widespread issue. And that's what you're saying yes to when you choose the the short-term pleasure, the short-term relief that porn provides. I don't think anybody in their right mind would actually make that choice. But I think sometimes we just lie to ourselves and say, oh, it's just one more or yeah, I'm not really, really ready to part ways with it. That might be true. But what you're also then agreeing to is the relationship dysfunction, is the mistrust, is the depression and the anxiety and the lost time and productivity and everything that comes with it. And I, I don't think anybody actually wants that for their life. Yeah. Sin always leads to death in some way. There's going to be death. Right. There's going to be death relationally. There's going to be death in your integrity. There's going to be death in your joy. Like you said, the productivity, our relationship with you, like there's just so much death that comes from it. Yes. And I, I love what you said. Like if, if we could just stop and for a second and be like, dude, this, I don't want that. Like nobody, no dude is trying to choose that, is picking that. Oh, I, w- I had one of the things you said, I was curious, no pressure if you hadn't heard this. I feel like it was a couple of years ago, I heard somebody talking about, or maybe I heard, like I read a news story or a study or something. I'm totally butchering it. But essentially, I <laughs> thought I heard, I could be totally making this up, <laughs> that like there was some secular studies talking about how porn was like ruining lives. <laughs> It had like no spiritual, yeah, you know, undertones at all. It was just, and I remember it was fascinating because like the secular w- world was saying, you know, this is actually hold up, wait a second, I don't actually know if porn is good for us. <laughs> like we thought, yeah. like we thought it would be. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? Or like, have you heard any of that? Or like, <laughs> oh, dude, there's tons. Yeah, there's okay. tons. Admittedly, the academic this was, world. Hold, this was back when like news stories would like stick around for like a week. Oh not, yeah, <laughs> but not like for like a minute. So I'm like, I remember it being like a thing for like a week, and then it went away. I was going to say, I don't know what particular study it was, but I could definitely share with you. Some of the research findings are quite interesting. So like they did a study with couples who were in long-term committed relationships. I don't think they were necessarily married, but couples who started watching porn to spice up their sex lives, a very Mm -hmm. common reason that that a couple chooses to watch and more common among Christian circles than you would think. Mm. And what they found is that the reported rates of satisfaction in the relationship increased initially when this took place which is kind of why it's what you would expect i suppose but it was a longitudinal study so that means that they stuck with them over periods of time and i forget the exact time markers but certainly after six months 12 months and a couple years the relationship satisfaction just completely tanked because of course what happens over time is you're conditioning yourself to experience arousal apart from your partner. Yeah, exactly. So it, it only makes sense that you would become less satisfied in the relationship because in some ways, sexually, you don't need them the way you used to, so to speak. Mm. I mean, I think we, we all could have figured that out, you know, but it's just interesting when there's research behind it. Yeah. Another really interesting one, Jared, for our demographic in particular is, so in 2001, the rates of erectile dysfunction were about 5% in men under the age of 40, which is, mm. again, par for the course. 5% is very small. That shouldn't be happening at that age group. Typically, it's later on in life. Hmm. Today, there are surveys that reveal erectile dysfunction in that same demographic, men under the age of 40, is reported to be as high as 25%. Wow. 
Wow. And that, so that's, that's only in just a little bit over 20 years. Wow. And so between the spread of broadband internet, obviously that's just normal now, but then the smartphones, uh, that's where you really see the spike in the prevalence because porn is, you know, it's the three A's, affordable, accessible, and anonymous. Mm. And what happens in the process, just to kind of drive this home, what happens is when you're engaging with porn, porn is a super stimulus. It is an unnatural amount of stimulation to your brain. And initially, it's overwhelming for your brain. It's why it, you have mixed feelings usually the first time you get exposed to something like that. But as you start to watch it over time, your brain just becomes conditioned to experience unnaturally high levels of stimulation to experience arousal. So then when guys are experiencing a regular sexual interaction with another human, it's not the same level of stimulation because, of mm. course, it, it can't keep up. And then as a result, the guy can't keep up either. So it's, it's becoming a real problem just even on a very tangible, logical kind of physical level. Sin always leads to death, man. Yeah. <laughs> always leads to death. <laughs> there it's it is. Just, yeah. uh, it plays out in just the most practical ways. It just will play out in the most practical ways, dude. That's really fascinating. Thank you for like putting flesh to the the makeshift skeleton I was trying to build with that research that I couldn't remember <laughs> what, what it was. That's really helpful. All right, man. So for a guy that's like, they're listening to this and they're just, they're tired. They're just like, dude, I don't want to deal with, I don't want to be 70 and like dealing with this anymore. What tools have you found that are like, okay, this is going to be really helpful for you. And then yeah. for the guys who say, who take the next step and say, dude, all right, I want to join the program and I want to be part of this. I want to take this stuff seriously. I'm willing to put my money where my mouth is here and finally figure this stuff out. What does that look like? What does joining the program look like and, and what can they expect if they get in? Yeah, so after running the program for a couple of years and talking to more guys and it's kind of like the wild, wild west what we're doing because this isn't like a diagnosable condition yet. Like I said, the research is lagging, so we're all figuring it out. So I've identified three pillars that I would say should be part of every single person's recovery journey. And the good news is for the guy who's listening who maybe thinks that recovery is a daunting process, you can apply these three pillars in your life pretty much starting today. Mm. So I'll just go through them one by one. Each pillar comes with a mantra, by the way. So I'll kind of explain what that is. The first pillar is self-awareness. And the mantra for self-awareness is, if you are not aware, it cannot be repaired. Mm. So a lot of guys are completely oblivious to the parts of their inner life that are actually contributing to their behavior. Behavior is the, the surface level thing. It's the plant in the garden, or if it's problem behavior, it's the weed in the garden. But as you alluded to earlier, there's a root system underneath that's causing that thing. It's the thinking patterns, the paradigms, the emotions, the feelings, the habits, all of that stuff underneath the surface. And a lot of guys are oblivious to how those elements are actually factoring into their desire for porn and certainly their choice to watch it repeatedly. So building that self-awareness is a great starting point. Two really practical ways you can build self-awareness. Journal. Just start writing out your inner life. Start asking yourself questions and writing it out. The second one would be if you have a friend that you trust, someone that you know you can talk to without judgment, start talking to them about it. It doesn't have to be extensive. Even five minutes a week is going to go a really long way over time. The second pillar is healing. Well, let's pause there for a second. So, yeah. the, so the journaling part, I thought that was really, really good. The journaling part, most guys are going to hear that and be like, dude, I, I, like, I, I don't know how to journal. Like, I, that feels weird. I've seen my wife maybe do it a couple of times. Or I've heard other guys, but I don't know how to do it like journal. What, when they sit down to actually write something out and they're trying to be self-aware, what yeah. kinds of questions should they be asking themselves that are going to pull out, kind of reveal what's happening under the surface? Yeah, there's honestly one question that we have all of our guys ask when they sit down and journal. It's, what am I feeling? Hmm. And we provide to them the feel wheel. I can send you a link to it after, Jared, if you want to put it in okay. the show notes. Yeah. The feel wheel is just a little device that gives some vocabulary for someone like me who was totally inept in this area and didn't have the language to articulate how I felt. Hmm. The feel wheel was super helpful to start just putting some language to it. Okay. So you, Can you that, remember some of those on the wheel that you could just spout out? We'll put it in the show notes, but just like... Yeah. The guy's so driving right now. Yeah. But yeah. Basically, the, the wheel has three different rings. So you start in the center with like the broad categories, anger, uh, like it's I feel angry, I feel bad, I feel surprised, happy, disgusted. There's a couple. Mm -hmm. And then if you take anger as an example, then in the second ring, you start to get a bit more specific. So it's not, it's not just that I was angry. It's that I was caught off guard or I was outraged. It's something like that. I was infuriated. Mm -hmm. And then the third ring starts to get even more specific. So it's like, actually, I felt anxious or I felt, you know, that kind of thing. It's just, it helps you get more and more specific okay. as you start to interact with the wheel a bit more. I love that. So, I love that. And the goal there is, again, for most guys, they don't know what's happening. And like, you're just, we're kind of reacting all the time. We're just living our life reacting. 
And yes. in many ways, looking at porn is just a reaction to, you know, like subtle reaction to so our subconscious, I should say, reaction. And, exactly. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is like allow the Holy Spirit to pause for, for a second, allow the Holy Spirit to like bring up what's in us, God reveal in me what I might not know what's happening there. And so I'm going to ask myself some questions and then just look at it in the face. That's self-awareness. It's just objectively trying to look at yourself, which is really hard to do. But journaling and asking yourself these questions allows you to kind of hold up a mirror to yourself, which can be extremely helpful. Okay. Yeah, good. Let, exactly. Yeah. I was just going to say the other really key element to journaling that we really emphasize is leaving a part for reflection. So after you have written some things out, putting your pen down and just listening. Mm -hmm. And I know for me, that's probably where I hear God's voice the most. That's mm -hmm. where I get those promptings, those nudges, like the wife and I get in a fight, I'm venting, I'm rambling, and I'm doing my best to label some of the emotions that came with that. But then putting the pen down and God being like, yeah, but you need to forgive her, right? Or like, you know, whatever yeah, it might be. Right. It's just getting that clarity so that I'm not stewing in my emotion and just drowning in it. But yeah. it's like, I've got it out there and now God and the Holy Spirit are giving me some perspective here so I can actually resolve this and move on with the day. I love it. Are you encouraging the guys to journal daily, weekly? We do. Okay. Yeah. Just because, especially early on in recovery, you, you have to start exercising that self-awareness muscle. Without it, it's very hard to move forward in the recovery process. So yeah, we, we have guys do it daily. We tell them 10 minutes a day, like five minutes for the expression part, five minutes for the reflection part. I love it. That's a great starting point. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Cool. cool. Second pillar is healing of the heart. Mm -hmm. And so we talked about this earlier kind of just talking about working through parts of your past, traumas, just things that might be contributing that have kind of entangled a little bit. And I think I shared in our first interview a couple of years ago about my relationship with my mom. I won't go into a lot of detail about it, but I had a huge breakthrough there, just realizing like my relationship was healthy, but there were some things that I needed to kind of work through and resolve. Huge part of my healing journey. But the general mantra for healing of the heart is, he who is most vulnerable heals the quickest. Mm. And vulnerability is a little bit of a buzzword. My preferable word is actually transparency because I think vulnerability, we tend to just emphasize all the negatives, but really transparency is just letting people in to see everything, the good and the bad, both included. Yeah. Yeah. But he who is most vulnerable heals the quickest. Just uh, what you're actually just saying, it's really hard to look at yourself in the mirror. It's hard to acknowledge that there are things that happened to you that shouldn't have or that, that there are parts that maybe you did, things that you did in the past that you're regretful about. Yeah. But being vulnerable about those things, being transparent, working through them openly in a safe environment, and obviously with some expertise to guide you through them appropriately, really goes a long way in the long term for just being a healthy person and making better choices on a regular basis. I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. And then the third pillar is identity, uh, establishing your identity in Christ. And the mantra here is, I would rather be 100% my true self and rejected than 80% my true self and accepted. Mm. And so what we're teaching our guys is to exhibit bold authenticity on a regular basis just learning to love themselves seeing themselves the way god does and then walking that out on a regular basis and this is to me the most fun this is where you see the transformation this is where you see guys who get free of porn and they quit their job and they start that business they always wanted to start or they mm -hmm. they have healthier marriages because they started prioritizing their wife again or you know it's just those are the different things that really start to take root as people reach this pillar and this step. And I think that's where, that's where you really witness a lot of the transformation. Those first two pillars are, are cleaning out the old systems. It's tearing the house down, like you said earlier, yeah. Jared. Yeah. And then the identity one is really building that new house back up. I love it. And it's got to be gospel centered. I heard somebody, I think it was Matt Chandler posted something the other day, basically talking about, he posted some quote that said, God loves you fully. I'm going to butcher the quote, but essentially God loves you fully in light of you at your worst, mm. which is just, you know, there's so many guys who feel like God, God will love me fully when I can get my stuff together. Mm -hmm. And yet God loves you fully right now. And he's fully aware of you at your worst, you know, and, uh, and with that context is still choosing to love you fully. And just there's shame that we wear the glasses of shame that are so hard for us to see that truth clearly through the lens of shame. And so I think understanding, like knowing myself, I'm wicked, but the fact that Jesus called me son and took my wickedness on himself so that he could call me righteous. That's a truth that is life changing. And that's just yeah. gospel truth. But you got to dig deep to like, to start to see that picture more clearly. This is just where like the practicalities become so important. Cause like what we often do, if you think about journaling, it's like you have all these thoughts of humiliation and shame and everything else. 
And like you said, we tend to like try to work through those on our own and then come to God. Mm -hmm. But how powerful is it that in those moments you're able to invite the Holy Spirit in, experience God's presence, and then let him speak to you? He's not threatened by our sin. He's not threatened by our shortcomings and everything else. But you have to actually experience it. The other thing I want to just mention real quick, Jared, I promised I'd give some practical things. For the identity piece, the one thing that we recommend is called mirror therapy. Okay. And mirror therapy is where you stand in front of the mirror, you look yourself square in the eyes, mm. and you speak the truth to yourself. Mm. And it's not I am, it's you are. You, you learn to talk to yourself out loud mm. because if you can talk to yourself out loud that way, you will start to talk to yourself internally that way as well. And it's kind of that like that proverb that says like the eyes are the window to the soul. Mm. Like when you look yourself in the eyes and you speak the truth, like that you are a beloved son of God. You are unconditionally loved. When you start to declare these truths and you speak them that way, it really does penetrate the heart. I actually used to, I learned this when I was still relapsing. And I still remember after a relapse, you know, I had kind of finished what I was doing. I was in the bathroom and I stopped in front of the mirror. It was like something stopped me in my tracks and I stopped in front of the mirror and I was like, you know what? I'm not going to go self-loathe. I'm not going to go beat myself up and do my little repentance thing that I normally do. Like I can't mm -hmm. keep doing that. So I stood in front of the mirror. I just looked myself in the eyes and I said, Sathya, you're going to figure this out. Sathya, you're going to get free. You're going to set other people free one day once you figure this out. You've got this. You'll figure it out. You know, But just looking myself in the eyes and speaking truth over myself, it goes a really long way to actually implanting that truth and letting it take root. That's good, man. That's interesting. You know, that I've probably looked myself in the eyes like twice. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, we don't really uh, do it that often. Yeah, yeah. I you know, normally look in the mirror uh, amazed at how much gray hair or lack of hair or <laughs> hair in weird spot, you know. Uh, but yeah, I think I've done it like twice. And both times, if I'm honest, it's I get squirmy. Because yes. when I look, look, look at myself in the eyes, it's exactly what you just said. It's the looking into your soul. Like looking mm. yourself into the soul is really... Oh, kind of a threatening or like a, it's a squirmy feeling. Yes. And so I like that. It's interesting. I'm going to try that. And I'm just going to like, dude, I'm, I'm beloved. I'm son of God. I'm, ch you know, I'm chosen by the King. I'm loved yeah. and delighted in regardless of what I can accomplish or not accomplish. Like all those good truths. I'm going to try that today. And my wife's going to walk in and be like, dude, what the heck are you doing? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Who are you talking to? Yeah, just, <laughs> uh, dude, this is really good, man. I really, I love when you come back or I love when you're on here and I appreciate you coming back and sharing all this with us. We'll end it. Just tell us how guys can get connected with you and all the stuff you got going on. Yeah, for sure. So what I would love your audience to do is get their hands on my book. I'm giving away for free on my website, free digital copy, oh, cool. which is the thelastrelapsebook.com. So the book's called cool. The Last Relapse. And if people do want to work with us or at least learn more about our program, once you complete that download, we send, we send the book to your email, but you get redirected to a page that just is a bit more about us. There's a video and then there's a chance to book a call. So if somebody does want to sit down and chat, see if this is a good fit for them, then we can do that. So the website is thelastrelapsebook.com. That's kind of where it all gets started. And if you guys are looking for some daily encouragement, then the podcast is called Unleash the Man Within. Awesome. You're doing kingdom work, man. I appreciate you sharing with our guys. Oh, it was a pleasure being here, man. Thanks for all you're doing too. Thanks, dude. Hey guys, hope that episode was helpful for you. I'm not going to ramble like I did in the introduction, but just as a quick reminder, we do have that dadtire.com forward slash community link where you can find guys either online or near you and just start getting connected. All right. I love you guys. I'll see you next week.